Hello, and welcome to Book Spot. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time, we'll continue our reading of Have Spacesuit, Will Travel by Robert Heinlein. We've left our hero, Kip, freshly recovered from nearly dying of freezing, somewhere in his own room, almost, on a planet somewhere near the star Vega. Fortunately, the people there are very friendly, if a little overly elastic. And he's about to be shown around. The hall outside did not imitate ours, where it could not be seen from the bed, but a door to the left was a bathroom, just where it should have been. No attempt had been made to make it look like the one at home, and valving and lighting and such were typically vegan, but everything worked. Pee Wee returned while I was checking Oscar. If they had cut him off me, they had done a marvelous job of repairing. Even the places I had patched no longer showed. He had been cleaned so thoroughly that there was no odor inside. He had three hours of air and seemed okay in every way. You're in good shape, partner. In the pink. The service is excellent here. So I've noticed. I looked up and saw Pee Wee. She was already in her spring outfit. Pee Wee, do we need spacesuits just for a walk? No, you could get by with a respirator, sunglasses, and a sunshade. You've convinced me. Say, where's Madame Pompadour? How do you get her inside that suit? No trouble at all. She just bulges a little. But I left her in my room and told her to behave herself. Will she? Probably not. She takes after me. Where is your room? Next door. This is the only part of the house which is earth-conditioned. I started to suit up. Say, has that fancy suit got a radio? All that yours has and then some. Did you notice the change in Oscar? Huh? What? I saw he was repaired and cleaned up. What else have they done? Just a little thing. One more click on the switch that changes antennas and you can talk to people around who aren't wearing radios without shouting. I didn't see a speaker. They don't believe in making everything big and bulky. As we passed Pee Wee's room, I glanced in. It was not decorated vegan style. I had seen vegan interiors through stereo, nor was it a copy of her own room, not if her parents were sensible. I don't know what to call it. Moorish harem, perhaps, as conceived by Mad King Ludwig with a dash of Disneyland. I did not comment. I had a hunch that Pee Wee had been given a room just like her own because I had one. That fitted the mother thing's behavior. But Pee-wee had seen a golden chance to let her over-fertile imagination run wild. I doubt if she fooled the mother thing one split second. She had probably let that indulgent overtone come into her song and had given Pee-wee what she wanted. The mother thing's home was smaller than our state capital, but not much. Her family seemed to run to dozens or hundreds. Family had a wide meaning under their complex interlinkage. We didn't see any young ones on our floor, and I knew that was because they were being kept away from the monsters. The adults all greeted me, inquired as to my health, and congratulated me on my recovery. I was kept busy saying, fine, thank you, couldn't be better. They all knew Pee Wee, and she could sing their names. I thought I recognized one of my therapists, but the mother thing, Professor Joe, and the boss veterinarian were the only vegans I was sure of, and we did not meet them. We hurried on. The mother thing's home was typical. Many soft round cushions about a foot thick and four in diameter used as beds or chairs. Floor bare, slick and springy. Most furniture on the walls where it could be reached by climbing. Convenient rods and poles and a bracket a person could drape himself on while using the furniture. Plants growing unexpectedly here and there as if the jungle were moving in. Delightful and as useful to me as a corset. Through a series of parabolic arches, we reached a balcony. It was not railed, and the drop to a terrace below was about 75 feet. I stayed back and regretted again that Oscar had no chin window. Pee Wee went to the edge, put an arm around a slim pillar, and leaned out. In the bright outdoor light, her helmet became an op opalescent sphere. Come see, and break my neck. Maybe you'd like to belay me. Oh, Pooh, who's afraid of heights? I am when I can't see what I'm doing. Well, for goodness sake, take my hand and grab a post. I let her lead me to a pillar, then looked out. It was a city in a jungle. Thick, dark green, so tangled that I could not tell trees from vine from bush. 
spread out all around, but broken repeatedly by buildings as large or larger than the one we were in. There were no roads. Their roads are underground in cities and sometimes outside the cities. But there was air traffic, individual flyers supported by contrivances even less substantial than our own one-man copter harnesses or flying carpets. Like birds, they launched themselves from and landed in balconies, such as the one we stood in. There were real birds, too, long and slender and brilliantly colored, with two sets of wings in tandem, which looked aerodynamically unsound, but seemed to suit them. The sky was blue and fair, but broken by three towering cumulus anvils, blinding white in the distance. Let's go on the roof, said Pee Wee. How? Over here. It was a scuttle hole, reached by staggered slender brackets the vegans use as stairs. Isn't there a ramp? Around on the far side, yes. I don't think those things will hold me, and that hole looks small for Oscar. Oh, don't be a sissy. Pee Wee went up like a monkey. I followed like a tired bear. The brackets were sturdy despite their grace. The hole was a snug fit. Vega was high in the sky. It appeared to be the angular size of our sun, which fitted since we were much farther out than Terra is from the sun, but it was way too bright even with full polarization. I looked away and presently eyes and polarizers adjusted until I could see again. Pee-wee's head was concealed by what appeared to be a polished chrome basketball. I said, hey, are you still there? Sure, she answered. I can see out all right. It's a grand view. Doesn't it remind you of Paris from the top of the Arc de Triomphe? I don't know. I've never done any traveling. Except no boulevards, of course. Somebody is about to land here. I turned the way she had pointed. She could see in all directions while I was hampered by the built-in tunnel vision of my helmet. By the time I was turned around, the vegan was coming in beside us. Hello, children. Hi, mother thing. Pee-wee threw her arms around her, picking her up. Not so hasty, dear. Let me shed this. The mother thing stepped out of her harness, shook herself in ripples, folded the flying gear like an umbrella, and hung it over her arm. You're looking fit, Kip. I feel fine, mother thing. Gee, it's nice to have you back. I wish to be back when you got out of bed. However, your therapists have kept me advised every minute. She put a little hand against my chest, growing a bit to do so, and placed her eyes almost against my faceplate. You are well? Couldn't be better. He really is, Mother Thing. Good. You agree that you are well? I sense that you are. Pee-wee is sure that you are. And most important, your lead therapist assures me you are. We'll leave at once. What? I asked. Where, Mother Thing? She turned to Pee-wee. Haven't you told him, dear? Gee, mother thing, I haven't had a chance. Very well. She turned to me. Dear Kip, we must now attend a gathering. Questions will be asked and answered. Decisions will be made. She spoke to us both. Are you ready to leave? Now, said Pee-wee. Why, I guess so, except that I've got to go, go fetch Madame Pompadour. Get her then, and you, Kip? Uh... I couldn't remember whether I had put my watch back on after I washed, and I couldn't tell because I can't feel it through Oscar's thick hide. I told her so. Very well. You children run to your rooms while I have a ship fetched. Meet me here and don't stop to admire flowers. We went down by ramp. I said, Pee-wee, you've been holding out on me again. Why, I have not. What do you call it? Kip, please listen. I was told not to tell you while you were ill. The mother thing was very firm about it. You were not to be disturbed. That's what she said while you were growing well. Why should I feel disturbed? What is all this? What gathering? What questions? Well, the gathering is a sort of court, a criminal court, you might say. Huh? I took a quick look at my conscience, but I hadn't had any chance to do anything wrong. I had been as helpless as a baby up to two hours ago. That left Pee-wee. Runt, I said sternly, what have you done now? Me? Nothing. Think hard. No, Kip. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you at breakfast. But Daddy says never to break any news until after his second cup of coffee, and I thought how nice it would be to take a little walk before we had any worries, and I was going to tell you, make it march. As soon as we came down, I haven't done anything, but there's old Wormface. What? I thought he was dead. Maybe so, maybe not. 
But as the mother thing says, there are still questions to be asked, decisions to be made. He's up for the limit, is my guess. I thought about it as we wound our way through strange apartments toward the airlock that led to our earth-conditioned rooms. High crimes and misdemeanors, skullduggery in the spaceways. Yes, Wormface was probably in for it. If the Vegans could catch him, had caught him apparently since they were going to try him. But where do we come in? As witnesses? I suppose you could call it that. What happened to Wormface was no skin off my nose, and it would be a chance to find out more about the Vegans, especially if the court was some distance away so that we would travel and see the country. But that isn't all, Pee-wee went on worriedly. What else? She sighed. This is why I wanted us to have a nice sea for. This is why I wanted us to have a nice sight see first. Um, don't chew on it. Spit it out. Well, we have to be tried too. What? Maybe examined is the word. I don't know, but I know this: we can't go home until we've been judged. But what have we done? I burst out. I don't know. My thoughts were boiling. Are you sure they'll let us go home then? The mother thing refuses to talk about it. I stopped and took her arm. What it amounts to, I said bitterly, is that we are under arrest, aren't we? Yes, she added almost in a sob. But Kip, I told you she was a cop. Great stuff. We pull her chestnuts out of the fire and now we're arrested and going to be tried and we don't even know why. Nice place, Vega Five. The natives are friendly. They had nursed me as we nurse a gangster in order to hang him. But Kip, Pee-wee was crying openly now, I'm sure it'll be all right. She may be a cop, but she's still the mother thing. Is she? I wonder. Pee-wee's manner contradicted her words. She was not one to worry over nothing. Quite the contrary. My watch was on the washstand. I ungasked it to put it in and... I ungasketed to put it in an inside pocket. When I came out, Pee-wee was doing the same with Madame Pompadour. Here, I said, I'll take her with me. I've got more room. No, thank you, Pee-wee answered bleakly. I need her with me, especially now. Uh, Pee-wee, where is this court? This city? Another one? Didn't I tell you? No, I guess I didn't. It's not on this planet. I thought this was the only inhabited. It's not a planet around Vega, another star, not even in this galaxy. Say that again. It's somewhere in the Lesser Magellanic Cloud. Chapter 10. I didn't put up a fight. 160 trillion miles from nowhere, I mean. But I didn't speak to Mother Thing as I got into her ship. It was shaped like an old-fashioned beehive, and it looked barely big enough to jump us to the spaceport. Pee-wee and I crowded together on the floor. The mother thing curled up in front and twiddled a shiny rack like an abacus. We took off straight up. In a few minutes, my anger grew from sullenness to a reckless need to settle it. Mother thing, one moment, dear, let me get us out of the atmosphere. She pushed something. The ship quivered and steadied. Mother thing, I repeated, wait until I lower us, Kip. I had to wait. It's as silly to disturb a pilot as it is to snatch the wheel of a car. The little ship took a buffeting. The upper winds must have been Dilly's, but she could pilot. Presently, there was a gentle bump, and I figured we must be at the spaceport. The mother thing turned her head. All right, Kip, I sense your fear and resentment. Will it help to say that you two are in no danger? that I will protect you with my body, as you protected mine? Yes, but then let it be. It is easier to show than it is to explain. Don't clamp your helmet. This planet's air is like your own. Huh? You mean we're there? I told you, Pee-wee said at my elbow. Just poof, and you're there. I didn't answer. I was trying to guess how far we were from home. Come, children. It was midday when we left. It was night as we disembarked. The ship rested on a platform that stretched out of sight. Stars in front of me were in unfamiliar constellations. 
Slanchwise down the sky was a thin curdling which I spotted as the Milky Way. So Pee Wee had her wires crossed. We were far from home, but still in the galaxy. Perhaps we had simply switched to the night side of Vega 5. I heard Pee Wee gasp and turned around. I didn't have strength to gasp. Dominating that whole side of the sky was a great whirlpool of millions, maybe billions of stars. You've seen pictures of the great nebula in Andromeda, a giant spiral of two curving arms seen at an angle. Of all the lovely things in the sky, it is the most beautiful. This was like that. Only we weren't seeing a photograph, nor even by telescope. We were so close, if close is the word, that it stretched across the sky twice as long as the Big Dipper is seen from home, so close that I saw the thickening at the center, two great branches coiling around and overtaking each other. We saw it from an angle so that it appeared elliptical, just as M31 in Andromeda does. You could feel its depth. You could see its shape. Then I knew I was a long way from home. That was home, up there, lost in billions of crowded stars. It was some time before I noticed another double spiral on my right, almost as wide-flung but rather lopsided and not nearly as brilliant, a pale ghost of our own gorgeous galaxy. It slowly penetrated that this second one must be the greater Magellanic Cloud, if we were in the lesser, and if that fiery whirlpool was our own galaxy. What I had thought was the Milky Way was simply a Milky Way, the lesser cloud from inside. I turned and looked at it again. It had the right shape, a roadway around the sky, but it was pale skim milk compared with our own, about as our own Milky Way looks on a murky night. I don't know how it should look since I've never seen the Magellanic Clouds. I've never been south of the Rio Grande. But I did know that each cloud is a galaxy in its own right, but smaller than ours and grouped with us. I looked again at our blazing spiral and was homesick in a way I hadn't been since I was six. Pee Wee was huddling to the mother thing for comfort. She made herself taller and put an arm around Pee Wee. There, there, dear, I felt the same way when I was very young and saw it for the first time. Mother thing? Pee-wee said timidly. Where is home? See the right half of it, dear, where the outer arm trails into nothingness. We came from a point two-thirds of the way out from the center. No, no, not Vega. I want to know where the sun is. Oh, your star. But, dear, at this distance it is the same. We learned how far it is from the sun to the planet Lanador, 167,000 light years. The mother thing couldn't tell us directly as she did not know how much time we meant by a year, how long it takes Terra to go around the sun, the figure she might have used once or not at all and is worth remembering is the price of peanuts in Perth. But she did know the distance from Vega to the sun and she told us the distance from Lanador to Vega with that yard at <clears throat> and she told us the distance from Lanador to Vega with that as a yardstick. 6,190 times as great. 6,190 times 27 light years gives 167,000 light years. She courteously gave it in powers of 10, the way we figure, instead of using factorial 5, which is how Vegans figure. 167,000 light years is 9.82 times 10 to the 17th miles. Round it off, call it 10, then... The distance from Vega to Lanador, or from the Sun to Lanador, Vega and the Sun are backyard neighbors on this scale, is a thousand million billion miles. I refuse to have anything to do with such a preposterous figure. It may be short as cosmic distances go, but there comes a time when the circuit breakers in your skull trip out from overload. The platform we were on was the roof of an enormous triangular building miles on a side. We saw that triangle repeated in many places, and always with a two-armed spiral in each corner. It was the design mother thing wore as jewelry. It was the symbol for three galaxies, one law. 
I'll lump here things I learned in driblets. The three galaxies are like our Federated Free Nations, or the United Nations before that, or the League of Nations still earlier. Lanador houses their offices and courts and files, the League's capital, the way the FFN is in New York and the League of Nations used to be in Switzerland. The cause is historical. The people of Lanador are the old race. That's where civilization began. The three galaxies are an island group, like Hawaii. They haven't any close neighbors. <coughs> civilization spread through the lesser cloud, then through the greater cloud, and is seeping slowly through our own galaxy. It's taking longer. There are 15 or 20 times as many stars in our galaxies as in the other two. When I began to get these things straight, I wasn't quite as sore. The mother thing was a very important person at home, but here she was a minor official. All she could do was bring us in. Still, it wasn't more than coolly polite for a while. She might have looked the other way while we beat it for home. And we'll find what they do away from home, very far away from home, next time.